Let's kick it off with our first talk from the S&P Global team. Um, they will be speaking about ML Ops drivers for an analytics platform. I am super excited to welcome Ganesh Nagaratnam, Senior Director, Machine Learning Engineering and Operations at S&P Global, Ashish Gupta, Lead Engineering, um, Lead Engineer, Machine Learning at S&P Global, and Moody Hadi, uh, Group Manager, New Product Development and Financial Engineering from S&P Global. Today, they'll be talking about challenges in implementing ML Ops. They will introduce the core ML Ops drivers that really led to the development of their analytics platform, and they will cover a mini case study. Um, as I mentioned before, please ask your questions on the Q&A panel, um, and the team will be answering them in Slack um, throughout the talk. So with that, let me turn it over to the S&P team. Thank you. Hello, good day to uh, all of you. I am Ganesh Nagaratnam, and I'm joined by uh, my uh, colleagues from S&P Global Market Intelligence. Uh, I have uh, Ashish Gupta and uh, Moody Heidi from uh, S&P Global. As you all know, S&P Global uh, is uh, S&P Global Market Intelligence is one of the four uh, subsidiaries of S&P Global, which provides uh, benchmarks, analytics, and for capital. Uh, markets and uh, commodities customers across the world. And uh, market intelligence, we belong to market intelligence. We provide uh, essential intelligence using differentiated data, and uh, we provide analytics to our customers. And um, in today's presentation, we'll be uh, uh, walking through, walking you all through uh, why we need MLOps, what are the core challenges, and what are the key drivers uh, that are needed for MLOps and how we can use those key drivers to build a generic uh, uh, data science analytics platform. And uh, my colleagues, uh, uh, Ashish, like, you know, will be uh, touching upon uh, the generic ML system architecture, and then he'll be layering an analytics platform on that uh, architecture. And Moody will be rounding it up with, uh, with, a, with, a, with a case study that we all did uh, a year back. Um, without much further introduction, I'll uh, move on to uh, the agenda. As we just discussed, uh, you know, we'll be talking about MLOps, the challenges, why we need an analytics platform for executing data science projects, and um, we'll also touch upon a mini case study. So why MLOps? If we really look into uh, the, the machine learning world, every organization they have got their own business units and each and every one of them they have uh, their own way of doing their machine learning uh, projects and uh, some of them like you know would be addressing a customer attrition issue some of them would be providing insights for uh, a future turnover or some of them would be in purely around nlp work but if we really look at these various machine learning projects which are being carried out across various business units within the organization they all fall into one core, they all fall under uh, three different core objectives. One is we need to have those solutions uh, that we build. Those solutions should not only take care of taking care of those requirements, but it should also be timely because uh, machine learning work is uh, purely exploratory and um, you do not want to get stagnated with your, uh, with your conventional business processes, which could uh, impede in, in, in providing an end-to-end solution. So MLOps uh, comes uh, uh, handy here. Um, it pretty much talks about uh, the accurate management of these uh, various machine learning operations. And that's a prerequisite in uh, delivering those uh, satisfactory solutions for uh, in providing end-to-end -end, uh, uh, end -end, uh, solutions for, for addressing the business problems. So if you look into some of the surveys, you can see that like why machine learning projects are not deployed seamlessly from of the, some of the questions that we got. In, in fact, like now these were uh, some of those questions which we answered ourselves a couple of years back. Um, most of the times we, we do not start with a clear cut business objective. We think that uh, machine learning projects are like a Swiss army knife. Probably they could be done better off. You'll be better off by uh, building in, uh, by using a conventional software engineering approach as opposed to doing a machine learning project. And um, you may not have a valid business use case to use machine learning for your work. And um, also uh, the data science teams that you have within uh, organizations, those business units, um, sometimes um, 
without uh, a proper uh, domain knowledge, it, you can uh, get into a situation where uh, uh, the team might be asking the wrong questions, which means that you are not providing the right result for uh, the problem that you have initially taken up. And um, you may not have a North Star metric for uh, for measuring like, you know, what what is your output of your machine learning models? And of course, uh, you also have uh, management resistance and uh, without any uh, significant uh, traction from the C-suite leadership, it becomes very difficult uh, for, um, the, for, for the process to trickle down. So the senior leadership should have a buy-in into, um, into machine learning projects. And um, also uh, the most important thing, um, which uh, you know, I stressed is uh, selecting the wrong use cases. Let us say that you're as an organization, you all agree to uh, work on machine learning, but you choose a wrong use case. And then you think that, oh, I'm going to uh, start, on with, uh, start on with a project, and then I'm going to be extremely ambitious with that, but that can uh, come and hurt us as well. So if you really look into ML ops, uh, you know, there's a myth there. People think that um, um, ML ops is just nothing but uh, instilling uh, the core disciplines that we that I have with DevOps. Translating DevOps into machine learning is ML ops, but actually it's a little bit different there in the sense that uh, in a conventional software engineering where you use your DevOps culture with CACD integration, the code versioning that you have is not the same as model versioning in machine learning world because um, uh, the half-life of a model is only uh, as good as the data that it sees, and uh, it's very less the half-life, which means that um, you might have an, uh, you might have to retrain your model for you to stay relevant to the business context. Because uh, the moment you see a domain drift in your models, you got to start uh, monitoring your models on a frequent basis and then start retraining them. So what MLOps gives us is it gives us that kind of a discipline wherein. Uh, it uh, enforces uh, that kind of uh, strict collaboration between the various uh, teams within within an organization, right from the project management office, from the developers, from the software engineers, from the operations team, wherein you build a culture uh, that would enable uh, uh, the teams to, to move their machine learning models all the way from inception into production. So, so where do I start? So at SNP Global, what we did was uh, we came up with a set of uh, uh, key drivers, which we thought are important for uh, addressing any machine learning pro uh, problem or a project. And um, as you know, um, the um, the first and foremost thing that a data science team that they will encounter is about managing the resources. Multiple uh, 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 team members within the same team, they might be working on multiple uh, business initiatives, and um, you wanted to make sure that you're not uh, you're 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 effectively managing those resources. GPUs are costly, and then you have to make sure you're not stepping on each and every one of their shoes. So that's your resource management key driver. Then the even within those business units, like you know, that you are executing for a particular uh, function. The, the data science experiments that you need to do, you need to have an ability to trace the code, trace the model, and then you need to have a proper governance there. You need to have a way to uh, automatically capture those models, uh, uh, have an automated way to pick the right models using the right set of hyperparameters for your machine learning models. And you should also have an option um, or a capability to, uh, to, to store these models because uh, machine learning models are even more auditable than a conventional uh, software engineering project. And uh, the third one is more about uh, the machine learning flows. So what we mean here by machine learning flows is you need to have, uh, if we can have a way to build uh, some of the generic pipelines using a visual tool, that would uh, simplify uh, the, the, the steps like you know, that, that would be taken uh, for for executing a machine learning project, for example, if I can have a drag and drop tool for the ingestion pipeline and uh, training pipeline and then inference pipeline, and then if that template can be reused across multiple projects, that would help us to have rapid experimentation. So that is also one of the key drivers for uh, for an efficient MLOps culture. Then when it comes down to deploying machine learning models, uh, there are in our uh, world like and there are two ways. One is you have the batch inference. And of course, and then like you have the real-time inference. And how quickly are you able to do both of these things? So that's where uh, the hot deployment of those machine learning models um, is so important. 
And uh, once you deploy your models into production, how do you monitor those models? How do you know that like, you know, my models are performing well? How do I take care of the domain drift? How do I uh, make sure that uh, the, my models are truly explaining the results that they are uh, generating? And uh, with these four drivers, um, um, the, the most important thing which would uh, feed in next is the scalability. So any platform or any tool that you choose, it has to be scalable, meaning the platform that you choose, for example, if I choose uh, a way to manage my resources, I need to make sure that I'm able to stress test my platform so that it caters not only to my business unit, but across my organization. And then uh, last but not the least, uh, you need to uh, think through the cultural fit. Uh, how exactly these various tools would play together in the grand scheme of things, and then how uh, it would fit into your organization. For example, some organizations might uh, stick with the resource management and experiment management, and they'll invest uh, tools uh, uh, for, for only to address those two key drivers. In our world, like you know, what we have seen is, if you can check uh, out of these five boxes, if you can check two out of five, you're in a much better shape, like you know, to build a generic purpose analytics platform. And as we um, as we all know, so what do we do? Uh, what do we need now? You know, we just spoke about the MLOps drivers, and then what we need is a comprehensive analytics platform, which would uh, take care of these uh, uh, core drivers. And um, so, what are the characteristics of this analytics platform? We saw those drivers, MLOps drivers, in terms of resource management, experiment management, scalability. So, when I build an analytics platform, how do I? What are the core characteristics? In our world, what we think is purely from a data science perspective, from a data scientist perspective, and from a machine learning engineer's perspective, these just fall into four or five buckets. One is you need to have a, a support for rich visualizations and analytics that can feed out of the analytics platform. And then you should also have a way to, uh, to support the big data stack. Um, you should use Spark or some other big data technology or the Hadoop ecosystem to process large amounts of data. And uh, the analytics platform that you are going to invest in must have a pluggable ecosystem. You should be able to connect to multiple uh, uh, visualization tools like Tableau, Snowflake, or Einstein Analytics for more uh, 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 in-depth visualizations. And the platform should also support multiple uh, uh, languages. And um, needless to say, it should finally fit well with some of the core MLOps drivers that we talked about, uh, you know, because the expert nature of data science projects feeds uh, automatically into that. So with that, uh, you know, I will hand it over to uh, Ashish. Ashish will be walking you through a uh, generic ML system architecture, and then he'll be uh, laying out uh, how you build a generic analytics platform on this uh, system architecture, on a conventional ML system architecture. Over to you, Ashish. Thank you, Ganesh, for discussing uh, MLOps drivers and their roles in building um, uh, an analytics platform with the understanding that uh, uh, every data science team needs a platform to develop, deploy, and maintain their uh, data science uh, projects. Um, we have to, uh, let's get and have a look at a simple ML system architecture and what is the basic uh, flow uh, that is there in building a ML system. So in here, uh, we can see that the flow is going from left to extreme right. And from left, uh, we start with some of the raw data. Uh, it could be a structured data, or it could be semi-structured data, or it could be unstructured data like some images. We start with some raw data, which is uh, highlighted here in yellow on top left. Uh, that data is uh, most of the times is not directly usable for our machine learning uh, model training purposes. So what we need to do is we need to do some validations and uh, cleaning of the data to make it usable. So as a first step, we have to apply some manipulations on top of raw data, and then we derive the transformed data out of it, which is again stored uh, in our processing zone, which is highlighted here in uh, purple. So once we have validations done over our raw data, then that data becomes uh, of some use and uh, a data scientist can perform EDA uh, or some feature engineering on top of the, uh, the validated data. All those features uh, and the training data sets that were generated uh, are again stored back into the processing zone. And uh, once we have the data ready for model training, 
uh, there is uh, numerous cycles of model training that is done um, uh, with the different algorithms, with different uh, configurations, and with different settings. So all those experiments uh, are again uh, tracked with the help of some kind of model tracking service, which is not only tracking all the experiment data uh, that is uh, like what is the configuration used, what were the hyperparameters that were used in ex uh, that particular experiment. Uh, uh, model tracking service is also tracking what is the output and what were the input data versions that were used to generate that model. So as Ganesh mentioned, uh, one of the key uh, MLOS driver is governance. So this is the uh, heart of uh, any system architect uh, system that is out there in the production. Once we have the data uh, model ready uh, and uh, uh, we are ready to deploy into production, we save it into our green uh, highlighted curated zone uh, and the model is then deployed into the production using some kind of production REST API service or simply uh, a dashboard is created on top of the analysis that is done. Um, so once model is out there uh, in production serving our predictions, uh, then our service is uh, there to monitor the performance of those predictions that are generated by our models. These performance metrics are again stored back into our processing zone so that these can be monitored, these can be analyzed, and model can be retrained as and when required. So we have understood the uh, basic ML system architecture here. Now, uh, once we do understand the conceptually, let's uh, the next step would be the looking at the tools that are available in the market to build that system architecture. To implement that system, one has variety and plethora of tools available in the market and one tends to get confused uh, which tool should be uh, used to create that system. There are uh, tools which are open source, there are tools which are uh, licensed, there are tools which are offered as SaaS, some as PaaS, there are tools which are cloud native, there are tools which can be uh, configured on on-prem uh, infrastructure. So one has to really look uh, into various MLOps drivers uh, and look at the system that they are trying to build here and choose accordingly. So let's try to break down this complete system into different uh, components and try to simplify the selection of tools. As you can see, uh, there are four major components that a system can be divided into. The for, uh, first and foremost is a data lake, which constitutes of all the data layers or data zones that are there in the system. It consists of raw zone, processing zone, and curated zone as highlighted here, and stores all the data that is uh, being stored or referenced or generated by your ML system. Another uh, major component here is your data engineering part where you do some manipulations on uh, your data, uh, be it generating or cleaning of uh, raw data, be it uh, doing your data analysis or data preparation for your model training. Another major component here is your experiment management, which constitutes of uh, doing the model training using uh, any of the library that is uh, available out there, also doing model evaluation, and tracking this whole process uh, via a model tracking service. Once we have the model ready, uh, we have this last piece of a component, which we call as model serving part, where you uh, uh, expose your model or expose your output uh, generated by your system via some REST API or via some dashboards. Also in model serving, we uh, also create some performance monitoring service, which is tracking the performance of your uh, um, deployed services and storing those performance metrics back into the uh, data lake. So now we have seen the major uh, components. Let's try to map all the tools that are available there um, into those components. As we can see, uh, for data lake component, we have various tools like Snowflake, 
or uh, cloud native service like Amazon S3 or Hadoop HDFS and so and so forth. For data engineering, uh, we have Apache Spark or Kafka for data ingestion, AWS Glue or Altrix as a tool. For experiment management, we have MLflow, Kubeflow, Domino, Amazon SageMaker, uh, and for model serving, you can see that we can employ Kubernetes to build your microservice or Amazon SageMaker to host your model uh, uh, over REST API. So this is basically not the exhaustive list of all the tools that uh, are there in the market. Uh, this is basically to give an idea how you can categorize or how you can evaluate uh, those tools that are out there. And this uh, gives you a fair idea of uh, which tool use can be used in combination with other tool. Let's look at a simple ML analytics platform which can be built using uh, Databricks uh, over Amazon as a platform. Here we have used Amazon S3 um, as the data lake layer and we have categorized each zone via a different S3 bucket. On top of S3 buckets, we have Delta Lake layer, which can help you in data governance by providing you different versions, audit logs, and the change logs. For data engineering part, you can use uh, Apache Spark, Spark SQL for data analysis, uh, which is provided by Databricks um, as out of the box Spark engine. Once we have data ready in transform zone, uh, you can also uh, use Spark ML libraries or any other libraries like scikit-learn to train your model. Databricks also provide MLflow, uh, which is your model management service hosted on Databricks, which can help you in tracking all the metrics that are generated via some experiment. Once we have the model ready in curated zone, a Kubernetes based service can actually expose your model uh, to the consumers or uh, you can use Tableau as a dashboard tool to share the analytics uh, results with your business. Once uh, your service is running in the production, you can use performance metric service to track your performance metrics and then store it to transform zone. So with this, uh, let me pass on to Moody uh, where he can talk about one interesting example. Over to you, Moody. Thank you, Ashish. Uh, yeah, just like Ganesh and Ashish were talking about, I mean, I'm basically the end user of the machine learning analytics platform. So there's a quite a strong reasoning for this sort of pipeline. Um, it's basically the really rapid development of prototypes to gauge basically addressable markets. So you can you come up with a concept, you come up with a wireframe, but then in order to really gauge significant market appetite, we have to leverage machine learning and, and basically a really scalable architecture in order to put a prototype in front of a few prospects to know what we want to develop in the future in production, right? So, you know, obviously like the, we all, you know, we've been using Kubernetes for quite a bit of time now with, you know, AWS um, and, um, and basically Docker. Uh, but really beyond that, the base, the management and deployment of these pipelines in a production environment or a staging environment, pre-prod, basically, it, it needs to be easier. And a lot of what we've been doing is actually trying to leverage these tools to make deployment and management of them when they're live in, in a much easier fashion. Uh, same, same thread goes around monitoring, um, where basically the monitoring... Uh, of things in production, you need to basically really kind of monitor and see, you know, get alerting capabilities, failover switch, so that like the end user doesn't get impacted. Along with basically horizontal and vertical scaling, where especially on the services that we deploy on the on the user interfaces, they require on demand um, a very quick return back of the results in small packets, so that they can be rendered on the screen. Um, and generally speaking, we try to, like the example I'm going to go through uh, is an example of using stateless microservices. And in this case, it is a machine learning NLP pipeline trained on basically Chinese uh, language disclosures. Um, I'll give you a bit of a reasoning behind why it's there, uh, what we did, and then, you know, what's, what's the output that a user would see, right? So why is like at SMP Global Market Intelligence, we see a lot of clients who have a high degree of unstructured data, 
unstructured data, which whether they be basically articles and PDFs or um, you know you know data basically um, federated data sets and, and different type of lakes. Uh, so one example is basically we're collecting public disclosures in China, and that's an unstructured data set. What the client has to do today is, is that they have to go, they have an exposure to a portfolio of Chinese, say, called suppliers or, or vendors, and they need to sift through the documents to see if their exposure, uh, there was a material event in, in mainland, and they need to really understand what that material event was. So analysts would have to basically read about like a few thousand pages a day in order to keep up with the disclosures that are going on. Um, so it's very manual, inefficient, human, requires a lot of human expertise. Uh, sorry, guys, can you go back? Just, um, 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 so they need to basically have some machine learning pipeline. To go back to Ganesh's point, it's like really the signal needs to be something that's basically specific, domain specific. So in this case, instead of reading a lot of documents, you get basically an alert that says, hey, there's a material event here, please pay attention to it and go down to it. So this is why we basically built this neural networks uh, in Chinese in order to provide these signals to clients. And they're looking at mandatory company announcements. We're looking at a basically really robust pipeline like Ashish and, and Ganesh were showing behind the scenes that's basically scaling it. Um, and the results are basically on a daily basis we're processing a few hundreds of thousand documents and the user only sees a signal that's relevant to what they're looking at, right? Um, and that's, that's it, it looks simple on a desktop, which is really the reason of using machine learning in, in financial services, is it needs to look it's very easy to use. So behind the scenes, what we're doing is we're basically gotten, this is like a high level overview of the pipeline. So we're, we've got an automated collection system with basically, um, and uh, with a series of uh, entity recognitions in order to match basically the company to the article. We use optical character recognition on pre-trained Chinese models in order to convert uh, machine unreadable text or images into machine readable basically data frames. Um, once we, we do have, there's a basic series of encoders that basically do uh, one directional encoding in Chinese in order to convert those into um, a vectorized model for the neural network to deploy and basically extract the opinion. Uh, once those are classified, um, you can actually, we, we, use, uh, we use basically explain, model explainability in, in order to identify the re, um, which areas in the document were the most impactful to the polarity. Uh, and then of course, you know, aggregate the scores uh, into it. Maybe next one, yeah. So to get a little more deeper, um, you know, we get, we get the articles, we do an entity linking extraction, which is a very common term these days, I think in industry, but really what that really means is leveraging optical character recognition. But as you know, a lot of optical character recognition tools, whether it's Amazon Textrack, Tesseract, um, you know, Abbey Software has some stuff, really requires a lot of pre and post processing, right? There's some, some always some pre-trained area that they've been using, whether the receipts or whether they're, you know, um, Wikipedia type, you know, disclosures. Uh, so they expect some information. So we've invested a lot in pre-processing and image enhancement to make that basically translation very quick. And then we tokenize them and post-process and clean the text so that we actually capture as much as we can in native language uh, in order for the rest of the process to work, right? So when we go into the detection piece, we've got a series of data frames that are describing uh, what those articles uh, are. And we look for the tables that have financial disclosures because it's, this is an opinion extraction system, not a financial real extraction system. We actually get rid of any numerical information because we're looking for the context of what, what the disclosure is saying, what the company is talking about itself. Once we get rid of those tables, we've kind of narrowed down the thing. So you think of it as a book with multiple chapters. So what we need to do is actually chapter them out because I'm interested in paragraphs that are across different types of books, even though they may be like in science fiction versus political science, right? So the same concept, some paragraph may be related across different books uh, and they're not necessarily even related to the chapter. So we actually section the article into little chapters, uh, create basically tidy tables and then once we have those sections, we run the structured tidy tables into the vectorized model, uh, apply relevancy classification, which is a network that's basically saying, is this something information that I would have seen before and would be relevant or not? So think about like, 
name changes in a, in a company are not relevant. So I don't need that. And, you know, uh, uh, financial disclosure is. And then once that's there, it goes into the CNN LSTM to actually, once it's relevant, it goes into the polarity scoring, basically use, uses convolutions and uh, long short term memory. Um, yeah, and after that basically goes to the aggregation system. Um, so, you know, this is just a kind of, I think Ganesh and she did a much better job than me, but basically behind the scenes when we have on demand uh, processes that have to basically uh, do, you know, get and um, get and post requests. Um, we have a lot of vertical and horizontal scaring through Kubernetes and and uh, and basically different platforms in order to kind of create. And this is like an overview of what we typically do for that. Sorry, one more finish. And just to give you kind of a little bit of an idea, the end client, all they see is basically a few lines over a, a two-dimensional chart, which is which is really cool because that makes the whole system very easy. It's very relevant. Of course, I picked basically the distressed names in China over this period of time, and you can see our polarity swinging. One little area to highlight is the, the downward and upward swing is typically a restructuring of basically the entity. So they, they basically declare they can pay an interest, and then they work at work a few months later, they work out with their, uh, with their debt holders to restructure the debt. So the polarity goes back up. And that's it. Thank you.